is the We Know the Moon podcast, where we love all things empath, spiritual, witchy, unexplained, and spooky. Hosted by me, Dee Safie, co-founder of the Goddess Temple Twickenham, and joined by lots of special guests. Hi, everyone. This is Dee from Weenie the Moon, where we love all things empath, spiritual, witchy, unexplained, and just generally spooky. I'm joined today again by my sister, Rhonda Safia Angelis. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, welcome back. I love recording with you. I'm here for a hostage takeover. (laughs) Yeah. If you want to watch the videos of this podcast, and trust me, you do, because my sister's facial expressions are just hilarious then sign up on our Patreon for any amount per month um, to get access of, to all season four videos. That's patreon.com forward slash we knew the moon. I'll put the link in the show notes. But can I just interject? You will anyway. For those uh, Patreon subscribers and future Patreon subscribers, not only are my facial expressions hilarious, but I did my hair cute today. I put on makeup for you guys today. I put on a pink dress for you guys today. If that isn't worth subscribing to Patreon for, I don't know what is. There you go. I made an effort for you guys. She does look cute. And you get a nice view of her garden with her hilar- hilarious um uh, pot plants, I guess the, the, <laughs> Oh, in the urinals. Yes. The urinals, yeah. <laughs> when when she urinals. moved into the house, there was a super interesting, um, like p- uh, plant holders uh, on the fence. And then we realized they're Victorian. Right urinals. behind me right there for Patreon subscribers. You can see my, uh, pot plant urinals. I uh, was very proud of them when I moved in because I thought, wow, I've got Victorian pot plants. Wow. That's really nice of the you know, the uh, previous owners to leave those for me. And then I Googled them and they're, they're actually your rhinos. They are Victorian, but they are your rhinos. There you go. Amazing. They look gorgeous. Yes. So that's a a special little something for our Patreon subscribers. When you were here last time, we recorded an episode on Stockholm syndrome. So do check that out. And we touched on this subject ever so slightly. And it made me really excited because I already knew I was going to cover this topic with you when you came back. So I love those little coincidences. So this topic, it's spooky to me. It's not nothing to do with the paranormal or anything like that. It's just so inexplicable to me that I really just wanted to understand it more. Okay. And I know it's something that you're fascinated by as well and that you're dying to learn more about. Okay. 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 So I'm going to tell you. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Are you going to do the reveal? Well, first, I'm going to tell you the term, the official term for it, and I want you to guess what you think it means. Oh. Okay, the official term is hybristophilia. What the fuck is that? Any ideas? Usually anything that ends in philia is like love for, yeah. right? What's the first bit? Hybristophilia. I don't, I don't have a clue. What? Tell me. Okay. it's the uh, Is it something good or bad? Well, it's... I. We'll see. Okay. I don't think it's a good thing. Do you want me to guess? Do you want me to guess? Give me another clue. No, I'm just going to tell you what it is. I don't have any more clues. It is the sexual interest in and the attraction to those who commit crimes. Ah! Oh my God. There's a name for it. There's a fucking name for everything. It occurs more often in women than men. And it often leads to something called MWI relationships met while incarcerated. So we're not talking about people who are in a relationship and then one of the partners goes to prison and they stand by them or whatever. We're not talking about that, which to me is much more understandable, I suppose, depending on the crime. They fall in love with someone who's in prison. It's the fact that the person's in prison. They actively seek out someone who's in prison. Uh, I have so many questions. Yeah. So first, this condition gets its name from Hybris, who was the spirit of or demon of insolence, <laughs> the, the, the spirit or demon of insolence, violence, and outrageous behavior. Apart from the violence, I'm liking the spirit. <laughs> and philia is obviously when you like something or love something. There are so many accounts of people who have committed, who are being committed for serial killing and other serious violent crimes that perhaps because of the press coverage, they end up getting loads of fan mail, much of it romantic or sexual in nature. 
for example, and this is what we we're t- where we're talking about it when it came up. It might have been in creepy, creepy hotels, actually, not the Stockholm Syndrome episode. We we're talking about Richard Ramirez, and he was charged with thirteen murders and five attempted murders and sec- eleven sexual assaults. What a catch, right? And he got loads of fan mail. Seven years after being convicted, he married a freelance magazine editor, Doreen Leoy. She she had actually met him before his arrest. But only after his arrest did she start corresponding with him. And I quote, he's kind, he's funny, he's charming, she told CNN in 1997. I just believe in him completely. In my opinion, there, were far, there was far more evidence to convict O.J. Simpson, and we all know how that turned out. So this is one, and we'll talk about the different types of hyperstophilia, where, I don't know, did she think that he was innocent? I mean, he could have passed. Yeah, and I mean, he was convicted not just of one or two, but of a lot. And he wasn't shy about it. And he was proud of it, actually, from what I've heard in podcasts and Netflix documentary. This guy was like, you know, has shown no remorse from what I understand in interviews he did after he was put in prison. Yeah. So, look, I, I'm really I know I'm struggling. I'm I'm on the sort of borderline of leaning over into victim blaming. We will talk about why these mainly women end up with this condition, but I have to confess, I just, I'm str- I struggle to understand it. You know, and this is the thing, it fucking frustrates me. Because I think why it frustrates me in general when women let men treat them like shit. I don't understand it. Don't understand it at all. I don't fucking understand it. And I know that's like, I need to understand people's situations a bit better. Well, Listen, I've had boyfriends that have treated me not well. Mm. I can totally get how you get into a situation where you're like, oh, but we have good times and all that. But this to me is different because they're actively seeking out someone who they know is convicted of these horrible crimes against women. Like they, you have the proof in advance. The victim blaming, it's like problematic because I'm instantly frustrated by them. And in general, I just think no one should be treated fucking poorly. Men as well shouldn't be treated poorly by women, but women should have the bare level expectation of like respect and be, to be treated well. But then I feel bad because I think, okay, but if they weren't shown that growing up, we want to know the backstory because the backstory. Yeah, it, we'll I, get to it because I'll talk about some of the similar characteristics of these mainly women. Many of the jailed Manson family members, because, you know, Charles Manson may or may not have been involved directly in some of the murders, but he was basically a cult leader and got his minions to perform most of the vile acts. Mm -hmm. Many of those members have been married, some of them multiple times while in jail. Mm -hmm. Then Ted Bundy, this story is just like cuckoo bananas. Carol Boone was a single mom. She already had one kid who was a bit older. Mm -hmm. They actually met before he was arrested. Mm-hmm. When he was working in Washington on the search to find the missing women that he himself killed. So that's like, you know how um, they often say that a, serial killers like to observe their crimes afterwards or get involved. So he was a prime remember, example of that. I remember her from watching the film about Ted Bundy's life with Zac yeah. Efron. I don't know how true. Can we just say how good Zac Efron is as an actor? Yeah. Yeah, I only remember him from like a high school musical or whatever it was. Yeah. I never watched because we were too old for that when it came out. Um, so but yeah, he's developed into a quite a serious, mm. you know, actor. I'm 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 liking him. Anyway, yeah. so look, they were friends, but when he went to trial, she started falling for him. She mm-hmm. even moved from Washington State to Florida, which is basically the opposite end of the country, diagonally opposite, just to be near him because he was arrested and went on trial in Florida in the first instance. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a guy who actually confessed again. He confessed. He wasn't pretending to be as innocent. There wasn't any doubt. He confessed to kidnapping, raping, murdering 30 women. And it's thought that he is responsible for many, many more. Mm -hmm. In 1979, she was a character witness in court for Bundy. And according to Florida law, two people can declare themselves married in a courtroom if a judge is present. So he asked her during his trial to marry him. She Mm -hmm. accepted, and Bundy declared to the court that they were now legally married. Mm -hmm. Got married during his trial. Isn't that 
just I mean, having watched, I watched a documentary on him and I watched the film with Zac Efron. He was a cocky character. I can, yeah. I, I mean, I remember seeing these, these scenes. <laughs> yeah. Cocky. Yeah. Smart guy though, wasn't he? Wasn't he a law student or? Yeah, he was, he was clever. I mean, you know, a lot of these people are because they evade arrest for so long. And even though they didn't have official conjugal visits, she managed to get pregnant while he was on death row. So I didn't know whether I didn't, you know, I couldn't find any evidence whether it was really biologically his child. If it is biologically his child, then how lax is security? That was in the Zac Efron film. <laughs> right. OK. But then they actually separated before he was actually executed. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, again, where did this come up in Stockholm Syndrome? When you meet in such an extreme circumstance and someone's shown you like their utmost worst side, what the fuck do you break up over? <laughs> then the hillside strangler, who was actually two people, turned out to be two two cousins, Bianchi and Buono. They were cousins who were operating in L.A. in the late 70s, and they're believed to have killed upwards of 10 women. Bianchi had one woman contact him after his arrest and convinced her to give false testimony during his trial. She was convicted for attempting to strangle a woman to make it seem like the Hillside Strangler was still at large. She was willing to commit a murder to kind of get this guy free. And then in 1989, he married Shirley Joyce Book, who he had been writing to. She had apparently been Ted Bundy's pen pal before Bianchi as well. So she was like just regularly writing to these disgusting men. Bianchi's cousin was also lucky in love, (laughs) Christine Kizuka was visiting her husband and father of her three kids in jail. He was serving 18 months for assault with a deadly weapon. But she noticed Bono one day on a visit and they ended up getting married. So why do these women actively pursue a doomed relationship? Hmm. I'm guessing, I don't know, it's like I just, that there's, I don't know, is this something to do with attachment issues? You looked into it. like Yeah, so... Let me take a, take you on a deeper dive into this condition. Mm, I'm, this is what I'm so curious about, the psychology behind the fucking terrible decisions. Yeah. Well, so there's some nicknames for them. I'm just like, got my ha- head in my hand because it just, oh, it makes, it really does make me feel nauseous. Some of these women are called prison groupies or SKGs, i.e. serial killer groupies. Sorry, it feels nauseous. <laughs> um, Catherine Ramsland, who is a professor of forensic psychology at DeSalle University mentions that some of the women in particular who have married or dated male serial killers have offered the following reasons. Low self-esteem or lack of a father figure, bad upbringing, bingo. That seems to be like the fundamental basis of women who have like, who accept to be treated badly by men. Low self-esteem. Come on, parents, step up. Yeah, low self-esteem and not being shown much love as a child. So it's linked to their self-worth. To be honest, I think what people grow up with becomes normal. And sometimes they don't even question it because... Or they just don't know the alternative. You're not exposed to normality. Going through these cases, I think I recognize them in a lot of people, myself and friends or whatever, who have been in relationships that are not 100% healthy. These are all just to the extreme. So low self-esteem, lack of a father figure. Okay, in quotes, some believe they can change a man as cruel and powerful as a serial killer. So most women have fallen guilty of thinking they can change a guy to some extent, right? But this is, again, an extreme version. Others see, in quotation marks, the little boy that the killer once was and seek to nurture him. So this is a weird, fucked up, motherly instinct, right? The fixer. Yeah, broken wing syndrome, but to the extreme. Okay, here's one that that's just really sickening. A few hope to share in the media spotlight or get a book or movie deal. I understand that the most because I, I really would hope there's some sort of fucking rational logic behind. Do you know what I mean? That feels a little bit less bad. It feels yeah. like they're manipulating the serial killers. Yeah. As well, which yeah. it feels a little bit less victimy, but also still mm-hmm. sick and twisted. Yeah. Then there's the notion of the perfect boyfriend. She knows where he is at all times, and she knows he's thinking about her. While she can claim that someone loves her, she does not have to endure the day-to-day issues involved in most relationships. There's no laundry to do, no cooking for him, no accountability to him. She can keep the fantasy charged up for a long time. Well, interesting you mentioned those. I have heard this personal anecdote, and somebody actually cited those exact reasons for not being unhappy their partner was in prison. 
Yeah, you don't have to deal with a lot of the day-to-day boring bullshit. You know where they are? They can't cheat on you. Well, they can. Well, but they can. You, you know where they are. <laughs> you can live a single life pretty much. They might be writing you lots of letters, calling you and so forth because they're fucking bored because they're in prison. Your status in their life is heightened because there's very little in their life. So your importance is somewhat elevated now. Some others offered reasons along the lines of some mental health experts have compared infatuation with killers to extreme forms of fanaticism. They view such women as insecure females who cannot find love in normal ways or as love avoidant females who seek romantic relationships that cannot be consummated. Again, like feels borderline victim blaming, but psychologist Leon F. Seltzer has offered explanations for the phenomenon of male serial killers attracting female sex partners based on evolutionary psychology. This, this theory kind of feels like it makes sense, but it's also, again, it's like nauseating. That's the, the term for this. Be the common theme in all of this. It's nauseating. Yeah. It's weird. It's uncomfortable. Okay. So listen to this evolutionary psychology, right? That's like survival of the fittest, blah, blah, blah. Serial killers, in his view, are cases of alpha males that tend to attract women. This is because such males were good at protecting women and their offspring, according to evolutionary history. But these men are killing women. That's what I don't get. He says women today may consciously realize that it's unwise to date a serial killer, but they're nevertheless nevertheless attracted to them. As a therapist, I've encountered many women who bemoan their vulnerability toward dominant men who consciously they recognize were all wrong for them. You know that other thing about how there's certain men, like women who are attracted to power, like power. Yeah. Is does that play into it too? That if this is their weird instead of going for like a powerful CEO of corporate yeah. corporation, they're thinking, oh, this is the equivalent, the bad boy equivalent, a very powerful you and know. kind of probably a much more attainable. Mm. Powerful CEOs are busy running companies. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. These guys are bored in prison. So this is like, is it the same logic as women who are attracted to? power yeah powerful men um mm-hmm. but just a twisted interpretation and again we all have it to an extent it just feel like this is probably to the extreme right mm-hmm. so there's two kinds of hist- hybristophiliacs there's the passive hybristophilia the groupies they'll write letters they'll find these criminals hot but they're not really willing to take part in criminal activities they often make excuses for the criminal's behavior or believe them to be innocent. They think that even though their partner killed and killed again, they would never themselves be harmed. Okay, so this is interesting because, you know, Raphael Rowe, the um, BBC broadcaster, he was actually in prison, apparently wrongly convicted. And he has that show on Netflix called like World's Worst Prisons or something. So basically there was this episode, this really old guy who was like in his 80s or 90s and he had this young, hot wife who was 25 years old coming for conjugal visits. She married him. She didn't know him before he was incarcerated. And she married him after he'd been arrested. He was, he confessed his crimes. Horrendous, even like child related crime. Like, oh. Awful. So she still thinks it's a good idea to marry him, be alone with him. That's the other thing. Very lack security in this prison. Alone with him in their whatever like special room they have for conjugal visits she had a child with him and it was a girl I think which just is even more uncomfortable considering his crimes were against women and I struggle to understand like why any part of this happened she's 25 as well do you know what I mean and this guy is so old so what the fuck is going on there? Well, another characteristic of passive hybristophiliacs is that they think they can change their partner. Yeah, I mean, she didn't seem unhappy about her partner. So, <laughs> so I can kind of understand these mainly women because you can understand how someone damaged from an early age might have this broken wing syndrome. It's just that this is to the extreme. Mm. But then you have aggressive, aggressive hybristophiliacs they're happy to help out their partner with their criminal activities. Mm. Just like the hillside strangler wife trying to strangle a woman to make it look like her partner was hit, was innocent, or the ones that smuggle stuff into prison, lie in court, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So Sheila Eisenberg wrote a book. I will post all the links in the show notes um, for all the books, the references mentioned. Women Who Love Men Who Kill, mm-hmm. in which she interviews numerous hybristophiliacs she says these women were seemingly normal, teachers, nurses, wives, 
you know, editors <laughs> as you are yourself. Um, but she found out that many of them, however, had a history of abusive and violent relationships. You know that's going to come up in their backstory. You just know it. Yeah. Some of these women knew the exact nature of their relationships. That is that it was morally wrong to be in love with a serial killer, while other women were extremely delusional and had idealized fantasies of their relationships. So that's interesting that some of them were like, yeah, I know it's wrong and fucked up. I know, but I still love him. Ugh. So is there a treatment? Well, sadly, treatment is not often requested. Mm-hmm. There's nothing illegal about the passive form of hybristophilia. There's nothing illegal. It's actually, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing illegal. It's like searching out prisoners and writing to them. As long as you are not yourself committing any crimes, as long as you're following the rules of the prison visits and the blah, blah, blahs. So unless they get busted for some kind of aggressive hybristophilia, smuggling something into prison, or like that lady who tried to strangle a guy to make the hillside strangler who tried to strangle a woman to make it look like her partner was innocent. In those cases, if they get busted, some kind of treatment might be enforced, but it's not often sought out. Mm -hmm. But here are some of the treatments that might be used in combination. Psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, orgasmic reconditioning, which is exactly what it sounds like. Individual expressive support, supportive psychotherapy, group therapy, which like a 12-step program like AA, but for sex addicts, hypnosis and medications such as antidepressant, medical castration, mood stabilizers, et cetera. So there are kind of treatments. The problem is that most of these people who are hyperstophiliacs don't see a problem with it. This is one thing I've noticed with, okay, on much less extreme scale, with women who have a repeated pattern of falling into bad relationships they don't realize it's wrong, probably because they've grown up seeing that type of relationship. They haven't been exposed to functional, loving relationships that don't. Or have- what I think it is a lot of the time is that they don't know of an alternative, or they don't believe that that alternative is realistic for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's it. They either don't realize it's wrong, or know it's wrong, but they don't what know what they're going to do about it. Yeah. That's life. Yeah. Would rather are more comfortable with the problem than the solution. Do you know what I mean? They're more comfortable being in that dysfunctional relationship. With That's it. It's a comfort zone thing, isn't it? Than actually doing something about it. It's hard going through therapy and breaking generational curses and looking at your shadow side. It's hard. It's hard work. Everyone has people in their lives who have bad relationships that they just can't seem to break that cycle. Anyway, so let me ask you this. What kind of reaching out to a prisoner do you find acceptable? I mean, it's not something I would do, to be honest with you. Like, unless it's a political prisoner and they're, you know, I mean, in Palestine, we have many who shouldn't be incarcerated. And who are not charged even, let alone convicted of anything. Yeah. Unless it's that sort of situation. I I don't fucking understand it. A guy who's, you know, I do know somebody whose mother is not a missionary, but I'm guessing, to be honest, maybe, yeah, um, maybe that is the right term, who goes into prison to speak to prisoners to sort of try to rehabilitate them. So I kind of understand that there, there's some yeah. sort of... Well, that's what I, the conclusion I came to. Did you know there's a website called Write a Prisoner? Most of the websites I found that were like this were based in the States. So obviously I had a little nosy, right? You can search, so this is Write a Prisoner website, mm-hmm. You could, like search, for, for, yes, you could search by location, race, religion, gender, and age range. You can't actually search by type of crime. <laughs> Which, but is this website, does it exist to help rehabilitate prisoners? No, well, so that's the pretense of a lot of these websites is a kind of mentoring, which I can understand. Mm-hmm. And I think it takes a very, very noble person mm-hmm. to mentor prisoners. Yeah. Um, you know, in sort of life skills and professionally and so forth. I, I believe in rehabilitation. Yes. And I mean, I don't believe that the prison systems here in the UK or in the States are geared up towards rehabilitation, but I would like to think that it was a possibility. And I think anyone yeah. that genuinely contributes to that, fucking amazing. So the amount of reoffenders, it's a high percentage of people that reoffend after being in prison for the, you know, prior. And it just shows you that the system is not working. You know, and it's it's different in other countries, actually. There was like so many people on this website. So I had to narrow my search a bit. So like I said, I could only really find American sites that allow you to search in this way. In the UK, it seemed different. You had to go through a charity where you get assessed 
to write to people in prison. And I think that makes much more sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the assessment involves, but if it's any kind of like assessment on your current psychological situation and your ability to mentor these prisoners, I think that's amazing. And then it's kind of sounded like they match you yeah. to a prisoner based on your skill sets or what you have to offer, blah, yeah. blah, blah. So that, okay, that's, that sounds very noble. Mm -hmm. And it was all very much about keeping up morale and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And I presume that those charities or those organizations are not linking you up with serious violent offenders, mm -hmm. especially if you're a woman and their crimes are against women or something like that. But even in the UK, there's nothing stopping you Googling a high profile case and finding out what prison a guy, someone is in. You mm -hmm. can do that, right? And write directly to them. But in the States, like I said, it was much more loads of like private websites where like this writeaprisoner.com where you can search by age, range, gender, et cetera. So I was on this American site. I thought um, I had to narrow down the search because there were so many prisoners on there. And we know that the States has a real high problem, a real a massive problem with prisoners. And their whole prisoner situation is just mm. disgusting and we can't go into it. But um, I searched for New York because I figured it was easier to get to from London. Mm -hmm. so I fell in love and New York is super cool. So I was like, cool, let's look in New York. Um, I put any race or religion and I chose the age range between 35 and 49 because it felt, but at this point it really felt like I was searching on a dating site. Yeah. And okay. Some of them were specifically looking for housing assistance or professional counseling, which I admire if it's genuine. It's like, look, I'm stuck in prison. Let me try to better myself while I'm here. Yeah. Right. But when you look at the pictures that came up, even that shocked me because I was like, these are people's fucking Tinder pictures. Look, I'm Whoa, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know, sorry, my printout isn't very good, but they were hot. And these pictures of them are like in the muscle vests and everything. Oh, that was just the first six. <laughs> I mean, I w I don't know what I don't know whether I was expecting mug shots or something. Yeah. Or something a little bit more professional or standardized. I really don't know, but I, I didn't expect like literally people's Facebook or Tinder pictures. <laughs> You know, because I just feel like it would be responsible for these websites that link you up with prisoners to make sure you fully understand what you're getting into. Yeah, definitely. Like, please be cautious. And like I said, I didn't get very deep into the UK one, but I found prisoner pen friends and prison fellowship. And it wasn't like searching a da database. You apply and you get approved. Mm -hmm. So assume I assume that both the potential pen friends and the prisoner are both assessed. And the aim is with assisting with rehabilitation. So I didn't get very far because obviously I'd have to register, blah, blah, blah. But that just sounds a lot better. So in popular culture, this phenomenon is also known as the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Mm -hmm. Let me remind you of the Bonnie and Clyde story, just because it is so full of twists and turns. Bonnie Parker was born in 1910. Clyde Barrow, 1909. They both died in 1934. So FYI, they died on the same day, so you know something dramatic is coming up. They were a criminal couple, and they also had their gang. They traveled through states causing trouble. They robbed banks, shops, and weirdly, rural funeral homes. They were ambushed and shot to death in Louisiana on the 23rd of May, 1934. They killed at least nine police officers and four civilians, so they did have a high death toll. They were the inspiration for one of the best films ever, Natural Born Killers with Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis. Great Why film. are you shaking your head? No, it's a great film. It's a fantastic film, isn't it? It was one of the best like soundtracks ever. Best soundtrack. It's just I mean, Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis are really good actors. They're sickening in their roles, and yet uh, endearing. It's weird. Yeah. But it's such a perfect film. It's you know every now and then they make film that are just so perfect in every way. Mm -hmm. They are often glamorized, just like in the film I just mentioned. Bonnie had. Surprise, surprise, a troubled past. <laughs> she dropped out of her second year of high school and married Roy Thornton when she was 15. Mm -hmm. They separated a few years later, but never officially got divorced. In fact, Bonnie wore her wedding ring till the day she died. Maybe she just liked the ring. I don't know. Clyde, too, surprise, surprise, had a difficult upbringing. Also from Texas, grew up very poor. And remember, this is like Great Depression era. Um, he was one of seven children. He was first arrested when he was 17 for a failure to return a rental car on time. 
which is a very odd first arrest at 17. Then he was next arrested for stealing turkeys. Mm -hmm. He then embarked on a career of robbing stores and stealing cars. He met Bonnie in 1930s. They started dating immediately, but had to take a break while Clyde went to jail for a minute for stealing a car. He was still only 21. He escaped from prison using a gun that Bonnie smuggled him in. Mm -hmm. See, this is why I don't think it's a bristophilia, because they knew each other. Before, huh? Before he went to jail, but I suppose he already had a criminal record and she was interested in him. But it wasn't yet a violent criminal record. I'm sure he had a gun while he was robbing the stores, but as of yet, he's not hurt anyone or killed anyone physically. But she's definitely, if she wasn't his hypostophilia, she was on the passive side, uh, on the aggressive side, because she's smuggling him in a gun so he can break out of prison. He was caught soon after and sent back, where he was repeatedly sexually assaulted. He turned around and killed his rapist at one point. That was his first murder, which I'm okay with that murder. Mm. But they do say, I have read that once you've committed one murder, it's easier to commit more. So this might have been like the floodgates opening, like the gateway murder, you know? Another inmate who was already serving a life sentence took responsibility for this murder. Wow. We don't know whether he did this for the acclaim or out of sympathy for Clyde, because Clyde was known for being very charming. In 1932, to avoid hard prison labor, he either cut off two of his own toes or got another inmate to do it for him. But ironically, he was released from prison six days later anyway. (laughs) Oh, God. He didn't know his own mother was on the case, and so he was paroled. But he was now bitter and a murderer. (laughs) So um, his own sister said, something awful sure must have happened to him in prison because he wasn't the same person when he got out. Fellow inmate Ralph Fultz said that he watched Clyde change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake, which, you know, if it's a prison where they're doing hard labor and stuff like... The fact that he was raped... And this was the issue with Bonnie and Clyde. They had a lot of public sympathy because of a lot of these things. They were kind of like working class heroes to an extent. Mm -hmm. Um, Clyde was now no longer in prison, continued his robbing sprees. He was actually, he actually wanted to get together enough money to launch a raid against the prison, Eastern prison, where he was at. To free people. Yeah. Bonnie and Clyde then go in and out of prison, usually just for a few months at a time. But In one shootout with the police, Clyde was shot, but the bullet was deflected by his suit coat button. They shot to fame after the shootout, where police were trying to raid the home where Bonnie and Clyde and the gang were staying. Police had suspicions of bootlegging at the property. They tried to access it, and the gang and the police had a shootout. The gang escaped, but they left behind much of their weapons, possessions, and a camera with undeveloped film. These are the photos that gained them notoriety, especially Bonnie posing with the cigar and guns. Have you seen these pictures? No. With them posing with like old cards and... I've seen the car pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And these guns and, you know, especially Bonnie, young lady with a cigar and guns and she's part of a gang on the run, right? So it was sensational. Mm -hmm. In January 1934, so this is the year where they get killed, Clyde arranged the breakout of Eastern Prison for a bunch of his friends. All the escapees were caught or killed by authorities, so it did not go well. Former Texas Ranger, think real-life Chuck Norris, Frank Hammer, Hamer, I don't know how to say his name, was brought out of retirement to search for the Barrow gang, that Clyde Barrow, that was the name of their gang, because they were embarrassing authorities very publicly now. I mean, okay, they caught and killed all the escapees, but they escaped, which is not a good look for a prison, right? Bonnie and Clyde actually had a lot of support from the public as they were romanticized in the press. But the more officers and then civilians that they added to their death toll, the less support they had from the public. Mm -hmm. So it was all fine and dandy when they were just doing like some robbing and so forth. But the minute they started killing more people, it was like, "Mm." yeah, you know, like I was thinking of the scenes in um, in Natural Born Killers where they're doing all these like pretend interviews with their with people. And some are saying that they're satanic and other people are saying, I love them super cool and stuff right Mm -hmm. it seems like it was like that so hammer and his team followed the gang to louisiana in may 1934 they hid in the bushes waiting for the gang to appear the officers fired 130 rounds on the car that bonnie and clyde were in the car was hit at least 112 times almost a quarter of those hit bonnie and clyde so bonnie and clyde were hit at least 25 times between them 
the police officers claimed they were deaf after the shootout because of the sound of all the gunfire. Looky loos were there quickly to steal mementos, bullet casings, and in one case, police had to stop someone trying to cut off Clyde's earlobe. Oh, Jesus Christ, God. The population of the northwest Louisiana town reportedly swelled from 2,000 to 12,000 within hours. People were flooding in. Curious throngs arrived by train, horseback, buggy, and plane. What is this called? Is this like extreme version of rubbernecking? You know, like when people yeah. drive yeah. past an accident on the motorway and they just have to stop and look, you know? Just drive on a fucking past, you know? Well, they've been following these people for months and years in the media. Beer normally sold for 15 cents a bottle, but it jumped to 25 cents and sandwiches quickly sold out. <laughs> to be honest, none of this sounds much like hibistophilia to me. It sounds more like two people with a challenging upbringing living the only life they know. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? Honestly, the one quote that like really always springs to mind in these sort of situations is where crime is involved is that morals are a luxury of the rich. And I think that's like George Bernard Shaw, I think. Poverty. Sometimes it's survival. And sometimes it leaves you with very little choices. Yeah. So I think this is why they initially had so much public support, because probably a lot of people were feeling what they were feeling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But for me, this case, and again, not a psychiatrist or psychologist, but it sounds a lot like a condition that is often confused with hibistophilia that also fascinates me. And that is a condition called folie à deux. Folie à deux, or in English, folly of two, is also known as shared madness, shared psychosis, or shared delusional disorder. And again, I don't even think this is 100% Bonnie and Clyde. I think Bonnie and Clyde were just kind of probably sane, but just desperate. Yeah, and sometimes situations get carried away. I know like sometimes it's very tempting to give everything a name and a diagnosis. And I am a fan of diagnoses, by the way, labels. I not think, I don't think they're bad, but it started off as petty crime and it kind of escalated. So yeah. Were they born psychotic, narcissistic, all these things? Probably not. It sounds like it's not off as petty crime. Desperate situations, yeah, exactly. Growing up in poverty, growing up in poverty God, it kind of got out of hand, you know? I want to talk about this fully I do it anyways, because it's just fascinating, right? So yeah, also known as shared delusional disorder, shared madness. It's a psychiatric syndrome characterized by shared delusional beliefs and even hallucinations. It doesn't need to be between romantic couples. It could be friends or family members. And it doesn't need to be just between two people. We even have folie en famille or family madness. If there's more than a handful of people that are affected, then it becomes known as mass hysteria. For example, check out the Salem Witch Trials episode to hear more about this. One of the defining characters is that normally the people have to be in close proximity, like geographic location to each other. Again, like hibistophilia, there's two kinds. Folie en posé is when there's a dominant person, the primary, like on below deck, the primary, inducer or principal, who starts having the delusional belief and then imposes it onto the secondary, acceptor, or associate. I.e., this secondary person would not have become delusional if it wasn't for the influence of the primary. And if they are separated, the secondary's issues often resolve themselves without the need for medication. Mm -hmm. So it's being like overly influenced, basically. Someone who's malleable. Exactly. So for whatever reason, person A becomes delusional. And for whatever reason, person B is susceptible to taking on those delusions. But if they're separated, then person B will stop having those delusions. In folie simultanee, simultaneous folie, the two people are peers in their delusion. They are often referred to something I identify hard with as morbidly predisposed. And they seem to trigger each other. So two people having delusions, but they're feeding off each other. There's no primary and secondary. Mm -hmm. Now, just to be clear, delusions are described as fixed beliefs that do not change, even when a person is presented with conflicting evidence. It's not entirely known what causes these shared delusions, but stress and social isolation play a role. Shared delusional disorder is diagnosed using the DSM-5, which is the Bible of mental health issues. And according to this, the patient must meet three criteria. They must have a delusion that develops in the context of a close relationship with an individual that has already thought an established delusion. The delusion must be very similar or identical to the one already established by the primary case. 
and the delusion cannot be better explained by any other psychological disorder, mood disorder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's most commonly found in women with slightly above average IQs. Interesting. Okay. They're not stupid people who are isolated from their families and who are in relationships with dominant person who has delusions. Treatment comes in the form of therapy and medication. So do you want to hear some cases? Yep. In May 2008, so fairly recently, the case of twin sisters Ursula and Sabina Erickson. Ursula ran into the path of, on, of an oncoming articulated lorry, sustaining severe injuries. There's a really good uh, My Favorite Murder podcast episode about this. So I'll link to that as well. (laughs) Sabina, the other sister, then immediately duplicated her twin's actions by stepping in the path of an oncoming car. Both sisters survived the incident, but with severe but non-life-threatening injuries. It was later claimed that Sabina, the second sister, was a secondary sufferer sufferer of folie à deux influenced by the presence or perceived presence of her twin sister, Ursula, the primary. But did she think Ursula had died? I don't know, because that would play a big role for yeah, me. Yeah, if she thought her sister was dead, and she couldn't live without her sister, then that was potentially a suicide attempt from the second sister. Yeah, but does that still come under folie à deux? Okay. I don't know. Hmm. Sabina later told a police officer at the station, we say in Sweden that an accident rarely comes alone. Usually at least one more follows, maybe two. However, upon her release from hospital, Sabina behaved erratically before stabbing a man to death. So, story. (laughs) We need the backstory. Exactly. There's a really good TV episode of lore on this case, the murder of Bridget Cleary. In Uh 1895, so an older case, Michael Cleary convinced several friends and relatives that his wife, Bridget Cleary, was a changeling who had been replaced by a fairy. They assisted him in physically abusing her to cast the fairies out before he ultimately burned her to death shortly afterwards. Mm-hmm. So again, this was gone down in the books as fully uh, en masse. Christine and Leah Papin. These are two French sisters. And it was this episode of My Favorite Murder that I heard first ever in my life. And you know how I love that podcast. I'm going to listen to it today. Yeah. This episode. Two French sisters who were live-in maids who were convicted of murdering their employer's wife and daughter in Le Mans, France, on the 2nd of February, your birthday, 1933. Uh-huh. This was actually, um, yeah, the first episode I listened to, and it creeped me out so much that it got me addicted to this podcast. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. I will always remember it because of the fact that they gouged out the victim's eyes. Yeah. Oh, okay, do you know what? I always wonder, like, when several people go crazy, and they all live in the same home, is it something environmental? Is it like lead poisoning in the water? Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's why it can't be explained by anything else. If it can't be explained by any of those things, then it can be marked as mass hysteria or whatever. But yeah, there's a load of cases of mass hysteria in the past where people have attributed perhaps to encephalitis or a bunch of other um, like swelling of the brain that might come from either food or the environment or whatever. So yes, yeah, oh. definitely. So here's a case, the Burari death where a family of 11 members were found hanging in their homes in Delhi. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's on Netflix, and I didn't watch it because apparently it's so haunting. Yeah. It was ruled as a case of shared psychosis or folie en famille. Again, with that, I was wondering, how could they all suffer from the same psychological condition? Is it hereditary? Is it environmental? Like, I want fucking... Well, apparently, and I didn't realize it was an episode on... uh, It was a series on on Netflix. I'm going to watch that. Uh It was led by the youngest son of the matriarch. So he was the primary, apparently. And the others were the secondaries. Uh So I was looking a little bit at the difference between hybristophilia and folie à deux, because they are clearly very different with some similarities. Yeah, so I went to an amazing lecture recently, Jennifer Reese, and it was so funny because it was a lecture on psychology of serial killers because it really divided my friends. Some people like you were like, oh my God, I wish I could come. And other friends were like, um, okay, are you, are you okay? I, think, I think it's whether you're interested in psychology and like what makes people weird and dysfunctional. And again, another perfect, perfect film, Copycat. Mm. I was thinking Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. I would have loved to have been at that lecture, not because well, I don't want to spoil anything, but Copycat, another perfect movie from the 90s. I watched it again recently. It's still as good. Yeah. Is it on Netflix? 
Um, apparently it's on the Disney Channel because I was having a look. Okay, I'm, I'm going to watch that again. Oh, I loved it. So anyways, Jennifer Reese talked about both hybristophilia and folie deux, and she was amazing. Her lecture went on tour around the country, and if you get a chance to watch it or ever go see her, I really recommend it. And she talked about a case, and I want us to discuss now whether we think it's hybristophilia or folie deux. I want to see if you can guess who I want to talk about. Husband and wife duo, serial killers, UK. Oh, I was going to say Mallory Knox. <laughs> no, real life, in our lifetime, nauseating pair. Wait, 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 wait. Myra Hindley? No. Later, husband and wife with lots of kids. I know who you're talking about. I think they're from Kent, right? No. Oh. Fred and Rosemary West. Oh, I was that's who I was thinking of. No, but they were from like Gloucester area, I think. Oh, okay, the reason I said Ken is because I think I read an article about their son living in a hostel in Ken or something. So as a reminder, like you even want one, Fred had raped and murdered women before he even met Rosemary. When he met Rose, she goes by Rose and Rosemary, not only did she go along with his crimes, but she helped him bring girls back to their house. They picked up women when they were in the car a lot. And so I guess these women thought, oh, you know, he's with his wife. I'll be safe, right? They would be kept captive while the couple raped them and tortured them and eventually killed them and dismembered them. They killed at least 12 people at the time of their arrest, including two of their own kids and possibly Fred's first wife. He committed suicide before trial, put in brackets, coward, and Rose is sentenced to life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Some of Rose's defendants claim she was suffering from folie a deux. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that there's defendants, but... They claim that with Fred as the primary, meaning she would not have done the things if it wasn't for Fred. She often committed crimes when he wasn't present. So does this argument stick? He killed his daughter from the previous relationship while he was in prison. So if it was folie deux and she was the secondary. How the fuck did these two people find each other? Oh, the minute he's removed from the situation, she, in theory, should not be committing these mm-hmm. this psychosis. If she genuinely suffered from it, the urge would have been absent when he was absent. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, I always wonder in these situations when there's a husband and wife team, that first time that your partner exposes themselves to be so fucking depraved and sick is to do any one of these crimes. The instinct, a normal person's instinct would be, okay, I'm done. We're done. I'm going to report you to prison. We're fucking, I'm going to report you to police and we're fucking done, you know? But the fact is that, okay, you know, maybe it's victim blaming again and these women could be scared of their partners. You know? I mean, I don't know. Okay, so I read the biography. Mm-hmm. I want to say it's like, Mom, I still love you or something. It's written by one of their daughters that, that survived. It was a really, it was a harrowing read. Oh, God, I couldn't. And those kids, even without the raping and the murdering and the whatnot, the abuse and neglect that those children suffered, if the count is real which i believe it to be even just that was just absolutely fucking disgusting never mind on top of that that they killed you know their own family it was just it was just horrible a horrible read if the book is accurate rose was equally a disgusting apparent and then where do you draw the line you know they would fondle each other in front of the kids which is like sexual abuse even if they weren't abusing the kids which i think they later on did you know so she was okay with a whole bunch of it and yes, she did have a very, very traumatic background because so Fred pimped her out. Okay. And one of her clients was her dad. They, again, did have a very, very, she very definitely had a traumatic upbringing. But the reason why it's important to distinguish between whether this is folie a deux or not is because is she entitled to blame Fred and just Fred? Or is she as disgusting as him? Is she a victim of folie a deux where she should quite rightly be tried for her crimes or whatever but with the view of her having a a condition or is she just disgusting i think she's just disgusting because she like you said folia do means that those crimes would have stopped as soon as he's out the picture and they didn't i would want to know aside from him what would she have been capable of if she hadn't have met him chances are probably not being a loving mother by the sound of the thing Yeah, so that's my joyous tour of the world of hibistophilia with a little detour into folia de. I mentioned some podcasts. I just want to mention some more because I listened to a bunch of podcasts while researching this episode. 
so I listened to an episode called Hybristophilia by Crime Culture, Hybristophilia by Witch Murderer. Um, and there was another one that was really good. Hybristophilia by um, Murder Dictionary. They were awesome bits of research. I'm unsettled after that episode. What are you feeling? I struggle with myself sometimes my being and being judgmental. I, I feel like we've had our judgy face on the entire time of this episode. We are trying so hard. If anyone's got more insight into this topic, whether you have been, a, you know, suffered from hybristophilia or you study it or you know anything more than us, which is probably easy, please do get in touch because I want to understand it more. I feel bad when I'm judgmental about situations far less severe than this. But like, I think it's important to explain like out of context, because obviously we are so much shaped by our environment and our upbringing, as we've said a thousand fucking times in this episode and in previous ones that people do questionable things sometimes because that's what they were exposed to. They weren't, you know, they had hor- horrific upbringings and I, I don't know that people can do better if they haven't seen better, you know, being exposed to it because they don't know that it exists. But to put it in context for listeners, just so they know why we struggle with these things is that we have parents who are still, we have loving parents. We're very lucky. We have never grown up with aggression. We have a, a father who is a very, you know, softly spoken, kind, gentle person who, you know, is why if I, I'm dumbfounded when women accept. I mean, this is totally us coming from a place of privilege in terms of our upbringing and our birth lottery that gave us great parents. Completely. We fully understand and acknowledge that, right? Uh, You know, the other thing is I think we were brought up with a, I would say, healthy sense of self-entitlement and the self-entitlement to expect to be treated well. Yeah, with respect. respect. Yeah, not the sense of entitlement that, you know, we expect lavish things and all the rest, but to be treated with respect and to be treated well as the bare fucking minimum. So honestly, I'm really shocked that I don't know what to say and give advice to people when they are in relationships where the man is clearly fucking beneath them. What did we see? Common trait here. They're all brought up, or it seems like a comic, common characteristic of people suffering from these conditions, that they're brought up thinking they're not worth more they're not worth respect they're not worth more than that you know low self-worth is the common denominator a lack of confidence is a lack is the common denominator and parents tell your kids they're fabulous every fucking day tell them you love them every fucking day tell them they look amazing they are amazing they are very fucking smart they can achieve and have whatever they want because i'm telling you the same people and i'm not a psychiatrist i'm not a psychologist i'm just telling you my life experiences but the same people and friends who except shit treatment from men also are the kind who are afraid to send back a below par meal in a restaurant. And it is like, you know, when you build a big picture, it all comes from a sense of like lack of self entitlement, lack of confidence. They can't expect less. Oh, it's okay. I'll just, they don't negotiate in a job interview. They don't negotiate their rates. They will take the first fucking low offer of pay. The same kind that like, are like, okay, you thought you want to pay me. I'm really grateful. Whereas we were taught the opposite, negotiate, ask for what you're worth, send back that shitty fucking meal at a restaurant. If it tastes like shit, if it wasn't what you paid for. So many bad things stem from, like you say, low self-esteem, low self-worth, not having a healthy level of self-entitlement. Again, we're not saying privilege or anything like that we're just saying knowing that you are worth being treated with respect and kindness exactly as the bare fucking minimum and more from your partner your life partner that's a bare fucking minimum from anyone you pass in the street if it's your life partner they should be doing then more than just giving you the bare minimum of this respect the thing is you can forgive a lot in a partner yeah you have to because people are human but if you if they treat you well, they treat you with love, they treat you with kindness and respect, then you can forgive. You know, I don't know what you can forgive. I mean, I'm not very forgiving. But I heard. <laughs> to be honest, we're not very forgiving. <laughs> I mean, no one wants a Ned Flanders, except for Ned Flanders' wife. But going for a guy who's committed like horrific, horrendous crimes, it's another level of chasing a bad, a bad guy, you know, a bad boy. I don't know. I hope this was an inspirational message for people. <laughs> said more about us than anyone else to be honest all right well thank you so much and we're gonna have you back next episode we will see you next week bye Bye. 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 
We Know the Moon is the official podcast for the Goddess Temple Twickenham. Don't forget, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can also visit our website, weknowthemoon.co.uk, for all of our upcoming events and merch. If you sign up for any amount on our Patreon, you'll be able to watch our video recordings of our podcast from Season 4 onwards. With all the raw bits, that usually means more swearing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>